This lecture will cover definition arguments and that'll be the next type of argument you write for this class. So what is a definition argument? It's the attempt to persuade an audience to accept a particular meaning of a term or concept by showing that it does or does not fit into a particular class or category. And I'm going to break down what that means exactly in this lecture. So when you have a definition, sometimes we all accept the same definition, we just need the dictionary definition and we move on. Other times there are contested definitions, in other words definitions that we don't all agree on. And when we disagree on a definition that requires argument and that requires an extended definition. And this means that you have to justify your definition with evidence. Uh, and usually this is primarily examples. And then you have to explain and analyze your evidence in order to prove your definition. So to do this, you have to determine if a term or concept fits into a particular class or category. So first you have to establish the boundaries of the class or category to determine whether or not a term or concept fits using specific criteria. Second, you have to determine whether or not specific examples fit within those boundaries, whether or not they do meet the criteria or do not. And this can be difficult because sometimes we don't agree on the boundaries of categories. Sometimes that's because of disagreement about old examples, but sometimes new examples can challenge the boundaries of categories. And so some people will want the, the boundaries to expand while other people want them to stay the same. And again, sometimes society's understanding of boundaries can shift, but people will resist that. Some people will say they shouldn't shift, other people will say they should. Um, and later I'll talk about the significance of the Supreme Court, and you'll probably be thinking of that um, even now, that we know that people disagree on whether or not we should change the meaning of certain amendments and things that we think are acceptable. Something else that's difficult is that it's, it's difficult to avoid uh, slipping into evaluation arguments which argue about whether or not something is a good or bad member of its class or category. Okay, so let's talk about art with this because I want to make sure you're, that this isn't just abstract so you actually understand how to do a definition argument. So if we were to define art, um, we'd we'd want to have a purpose for that. So for example, we might want to determine whether or not we think graffiti is art, or we might even argue about whether or not a specific work of graffiti is art. So to do that, we'd have to develop a definition of art, first of all, by determining the characteristics something must have to be considered art. In other words, what for you something has to have for you to look at it and say that is art um, versus that's not art. I don't know why people would call that art. And as you're thinking about this, um, we'd have to narrow this down, of course. So I'm going to be talking specifically about the visual arts. So that excludes literature, music, dance, and so on. And you would want to narrow your focus if, if you had such a big concept to define. So if I were defining art, my possible criteria, my definition of art, what has to be present for something to be art, might be these three. Uh, use of visual elements, elements like form, space, color, etc. for a creative purpose. So I feel like that's the basic, you know, there has to be those visual elements for something to be visual art. I might also think that there has to be effort to use one's skill and or imagination for a creative purpose. So that implies intent uh, on the artist's part, um, either to demonstrate a skill, build a skill, use one's imagination whether or not they have the skill or not, and so on. So notice I'm not saying they have to be good at art in order for what they do to meet that criteria and the attempt to express and or evoke some kind of meaning or feeling. So there is an intent to connect with an audience with the art, either um, oneself or a bigger audience for some kind of purpose. 
And you might be thinking, that's not what art is. These are, there are other criteria that are important. But I want to stick with these three um, just for the purpose of discussion um, of some examples. So first of all, uh, we have an example of traditional art, Van Gogh's The Starry Night. I don't know that I've ever heard anyone say that's not art. Everyone seems to agree, right? It's more traditional. It's more what we would expect of art. Has those use... Um, those visual elements that I talked about. It definitely has effort to use skill and imagination for a creative purpose. And there's definitely some meaning and feeling in this work, um, both on the part of the artist and in our response to it. And of course, this has the support of tradition, right? People have said it's art, so therefore we're inclined to believe it's art. And so it's a little bit easier for us to see this as art. Sometimes people have said that graffiti is not art um, for various reasons. They don't believe it is art. Um, and this was much more common when graffiti was new and people felt that art was what was in a museum. They had a very traditional view of art. Um, but if you look at this particular work of graffiti, has usual, uh, it has those visual elements like form, space, color, etc. has a creative purpose. There's skill involved and imagination and it has a creative purpose. And then there's the attempt to express and or evoke some kind of meaning or feeling. We could look at this and interpret what does it mean. And so this one seems pretty simple um, that this would be considered art based on my definition. Now sometimes people might say, well, it's on a wall, if that's illegal, if it wasn't, you know, commissioned or whatever, then it's not art. Um, but keep in mind that the ethics of graffiti wouldn't be part of a discussion of whether or not something is or is not art. Um, doesn't have to be legal, doesn't have to be approved for it to be art. Okay, then we have another example of graffiti and this really challenges this definition because you know you might look at this and think right away that it's not art. That's a, a fairly typical response and of course some of you might be thinking no it's art uh, for whatever reasons but a lot of people would look at this and think that's not art it's just somebody writing on a wall. So we have to look at the definition to assess, though. When we're making a definition argument, we can't just say it's not art because I say so. It's not art because it's not art. Uh, we have to look at the definition. So use of visual elements like form, space, color, etc. for creative purpose. So we definitely have the use of the wall, of the paint, and so on. Uh, it could be seen as creative, right? Someone's trying to make a joke. Sorry about your wall. Um, so I would say that this, for most people, is going to meet this definition. Uh, then we have the effort to use one's skill and or imagination for a creative purpose. This is where this gets a little more difficult to decide because there is the skill of handwriting, but is this actually artistic skill? And so as we're thinking about this, we'd have to think about, okay, if you're inclined to say that this is art, this might be easy to say yes. Okay, use the handwriting skill. Um, there, it's imagination. It's making this joke about the wall. But if you feel, no, this really does not meet this, this should not meet this definition, then you might need to change the criteria. Um, so, for example, I might say artistic effort to use one's skill because uh, I think most of us think that handwriting is different than artistic expression uh, and that might exclude this, but I'd have to make that argument. And then, of course, we have the attempt to express and or evoke some kind of meaning or feeling. Again, you know, being sarcastic, trying to be funny, um, that is some kind of meaning or feeling. So I think this one is much easier. So it's really that second criterion that we'd have to decide, okay, are we comfortable including this in the definition or does the definition need to change in order to exclude this 
uh, because that's what we would argue that this does not belong. Like I said, you might think it does belong, then you'd want to make sure your criteria allow this into your definition. So why does this matter? Uh, you're going to be writing a definition of freedom and arguing whether or not we are or are not free based on your definition, which is important in itself. But definition arguments are important to be able to construct for a lot of reasons. Um, one is that even if you're not writing a definition argument only, uh, it can be important to establish a definition. And that's because if you and your audience don't agree on a term or concept, your audience might not accept your claim. And so you might need to create a definition, convince your audience of that definition in order to make them accept your claim. And then, of course, many of the most important arguments that we have are rooted in disagreement over definition. And this does connect to ethical arguments as well, questions of right and wrong. Uh, so abortion, the, the debate on abortion, people disagree on when life begins and what life is. And some people would say that it begins at conception. Some would say it begins at another time at birth or somewhere in between those two. Um, and that's part of what the disagreement is because, you know, most people would say, yes, murder is wrong, but they disagree on when life starts and when murder would, would be applied. Uh, then we have excessive police force. What police actions qualify as excessive force? What is appropriate and what's not? Uh, and then if a suspect dies because of an act deemed excessive force, is that death a homicide? Because uh, those would involve other definitions. And then we have campaign finance and corruption. What qualifies as corruption? Is it any kind of donation to a candidate and then expecting something re in return, even if it's just policies that you know you agree with? Or is it quid quo pro, um, specifically based on the influence of contributions? And then, of course, we have the Supreme Court that I talked about earlier. Uh, the Supreme Court looks at laws, practices, and policies and decides are they constitutional or not. And so the Constitution provides the boundaries of the category constitutional. They look at the Constitution, they use that to make their decisions. Um, but as you know from reading the Constitution, we don't have a lot to go on. Um, the language is sparse, there aren't examples that would help us understand the definition of each amendment, of each clause, uh, so that it's a challenge for Supreme Court justices. Uh, so they sometimes disagree on the meaning of the terms within the category, which create additional arguments by definition. For example, Second Amendment, what is a militia exa exactly? Some people would say that the people, that's the militia. Other people would say, no, it's the standing um, army of within the nation, so that would be the National Guard, and so creates those additional definition arguments. And then, of course, understandings of the Constitution and its terms change over time. Just like with art, new cases have challenged old understandings, and then changes in society have shaped the way we understand the Constitution. Whether you think that's right or not, that's what's happened. Uh, and so that challenges those definitions so that definitions from before, from old cases, which are used in Supreme Court decisions, are challenged and the definitions evolve. Okay. So that's it for this lecture. I hope that better helps you better understand definition arguments and helps you with your definition argument essay. Please let me know if you have any questions about any of these concepts.